All right, our next talk is by Matthew Lawler on the feedforward learning of mixture models. Hi, so this is my PhD work that I did with my advisor, Stephen Zucker. Uh, this talk can be viewed kind of in two different ways. Uh, first, as an online algorithm for learning mixture models that's inspired by recent work on tensor moment estimators. And second, as a theoretical model for learning in neurobiology. Uh, pu putting machine learning and neurobiology together is one of the original motivators for this conference and it's a, a dynamic I, I really enjoy. Um, Probably the first theoretical model for learning in the brain comes from Hebb, uh, whose uh, learning rule is sort of frequently stated as uh, cells that fire together, wire together. Uh, and you can construct kind of a toy model for a neuron based off of this idea. You have a linear neuron that has some activity of some sort that's, that's uh, a linear function of the input data, D, and some synaptic weights, uh, M. And then for Hebb, this synaptic modification is in the direction of the input, D, and it's scaled by the overall activity level of the neuron. Uh, and in this toy model, the synaptic weights are growing without bound. Um, there are stabilized versions of it that address this issue, uh, which can do things like learn principal components of the input. Uh, however, there's this is still basically only going to learn information contained in the correlations between the input dimensions. There's significantly higher order information in uh, natural image statistics than can be captured by these pairwise correlations. So our, our goal here is, is going to be to try to learn that. Uh, so the main contribution of this talk, uh, we present a novel feedforward learning rule which provably learns selectivity for individual mixture components in a mixture model. Uh, this Learning rule relies crucially on a multi-view assumption, which I'll get to in a bit, uh, which allows it to avoid several hardness barriers in mixture model estimation. Uh, unlike other tensor learning rules with a mixture model assumption, uh, our learning rule is online uh, and it will not require the computation of any sort of moment tensor. Uh, this is perfect for a biological algorithm which can't necessarily store large quantities of data in each and every neuron. Uh, and we'll show that this multi-view assumption provides a new interpretation for the role of spike timing dependent plasticity in biological learning. Uh, so our learning rule is a, a sort of a generalization of a classic learning rule called the Binenstock, Cooper, and Monroe learning rule. Uh, and it was originally designed to address some of the normalization uh, problems associated with Hebbian learning. Uh, so as with Hebbian learning, the synaptic weights move in the direction of the input data. However, the sign and magnitude of this weight change is controlled by a nonlinear function, uh, which depends on both the activity level of the neuron and a sliding threshold. So this sliding threshold grows super linearly with the average, uh, super linearly with the uh, activity of the neuron. Uh, and this acts as a regulatory mechanism to prevent the synaptic weights from growing without bound. Um, for high level, for activity levels that are higher than uh, this sliding threshold, the uh, neuron will become more selective for that input and if the neuron is, is weakly activated by this input, then it will be somewhat inhibited by it. So, the classical BCM rule can be viewed as a kind of gradient uh, ascent if you give it a very restricted input model. So imagine you have k data vectors in Rn, where n is greater than or equal to k, and these data vectors are linearly independent. So imagine selecting these data vectors uh, uniformly at random with some probability, alpha, probability distribution alpha. So you can define an objective function in, in the uh, activity level of the neuron to each of these inputs, um, which is Rm. And you can show that with this particular input model, the expected update of the BCM rule performs a gradient ascent in this objective function. So BCM is basically performing a kind of stochastic gradient ascent in, in, in R. Um, you can rewrite this Rm uh, in, a, in, a, in a tensor form. Um, so you can think of these two tensors, T and M, as uh, expected third and second order uh, uh, tensor products of the original data vectors. So we'll get back to what these are, wh what these are good for, but 
the most important feature of this uh, objective function is that the local maxima of it uh, occur when the neuron is selective for one and only one of its inputs. So you're given D inputs over time, the neuron will gradually converge to a period where, it converge to a state where it is responding to only one of its original inputs. Unfortunately, this property degrades when exposed to sort of more realistic input. So if you imagine adding some Gaussian noise to your input data, uh, then the selectivity of this neuron, uh, of a, the classical BCM neuron will slowly drift away from the means of these Gaussian distributions. Uh, and as soon as the noise is sort of roughly of the same order as the distance between your uh, data vectors, the selectivity of this will collapse. This is unfortunate um, because mixture models are a much richer and more interesting input distribution, uh, class of inputs to deal with. Um, for example, Bernoulli mixture models, uh, when applied to natural images of edges and lines, give uh, reveal that curvature is sort of a, a, an important fundamental feature of these edge distributions. Um, so we want to be able to uh, learn mixture learn mixture models with a rule of this type. Uh, so our input model is going to change somewhat. We're going to assume that our data vectors are drawn from some mixture distribution. Um, we have k different uh, mixture distributions uh, that we are selecting from. As before, we assume that k is less than n, the dimension of the space, and we assume that the uh, expected value of our data vector conditioned on being in one of these uh, distributions we'll call dk. So these uh, class conditional means are going to take the place of the discrete data vectors in the classical BCM learning rule. We also assume that we have access to independent triplets um, drawn from these distributions. So we choose one of our conditional distributions and then we are able to sample at least three times from it. We don't necessarily know what mixture our data is coming from, but we do know that at least these three data points are going to come from the same distribution. Um, under this assumption, we can construct identical tensors as in the classical BCM objective function except the class conditional means will take the place of the discrete input vectors. So these T and M are identical to the T and M in the classical BCM rule, except now our input data is coming from this much richer class. Um, so as with classical BCM, we define our, our learning rule as effectively performing gradient descent in this objective function R constructed from these two tensors. Uh, so that looks essentially like this. So we have CI, which is the activity level of the neuron to triplet I, uh, and our stochastic update will be uh, essentially gradient descent in that objective function. So our theorem is with a properly chosen step size, this learning rule will converge with probability one, and the expected activity for this neuron will be non-zero for one and only one mixture. This is basically the geometry of the situation. Uh, we have a mixture, mixture model, two Gaussian mixtures. One has mean D1, one has mean D2. The two stable points of this network will be M1 and M2, where M1 will be uh, orthogonal to D2, and M2 is orthogonal to D1. So each of them is selective in expectation for only one of these classes. Uh, this selectivity will be independent of the actual distribution of the mixtures as long as they have bounded variants, and it will depend only on their class conditional mean. So we'll take a little bit of a closer look at what this learning rule actually looks like. So as with the classical Hebbian rule, the uh, synaptic weights will move in the direction of uh, the presynaptic input, and it will be scaled now by the postsynaptic activity at two disjoint time periods. So this has a massively improved invariance to noise. So as you increase the variance of these uh, Gaussians, the uh, uh, so points won't actually move. You stay stable. So the question is, where can we get these independent triplets in, in natural data? So imagine that you uh, are, you look at a fixed object, uh, 
your retina produces a chain of spikes. You move and fixate on another object, you get another chain of spikes. Then you get multiple samples from over the entire course of the time period uh, that you are viewing that depend on uh, a single input, uh, the object that you're staring at. So you can kind of get these independent triplets from spike trains themselves. Uh, there are also many theoretical models for uh, spike train triplets, which allow you to get access to these kinds, this kind of data. Um, so the question is, how does the brain actually respond to spike inputs? So the strength of synaptic connections uh, in, in cortex is modulated by the activity of both pre- and postsynaptic neurons. Um, and it, in fact, it depends on, on the precise timing of pre- and postsynaptic spikes. So uh, a presynaptic pre neuron firing followed by a postsynaptic neuron firing will increase the uh, synaptic strength between them, and the reverse will decrease it. Uh, this is known as spike timing dependent plasticity. It doesn't just depend on uh, pairs of spikes, but it actually depends on higher order interactions between spike uh, spikes. So we constructed a model of uh, triplet BCM where our activity is sort of represented by an average voltage over a short time window. Um, we have our spikes, uh, our spikes have an exponential decay and we assume that uh, adjacent time windows uh, correspond to our independent samples. So we, fit, we fit our model by assuming a fixed scaling constant and setting a, a fixed theta. As you can see, it, it fits uh, spike timing dependent plasticity data from rat hippocampus extremely well. This is uh, data by uh, Mu Ming Fu et al. Uh, and it also fits uh, data on triplets of spikes uh, without any changes in its parameters. So uh, higher order spike statistics, triplets matter for learning, and our model explains them as well. Um, so, one of our neurons will uh, eventually stabilize to be selective for one and only one mixture. Uh, ideally, you would want to be able to be selective for multiple mixtures and have different neurons represent it. Uh, you can construct a, a lateral network that achieves precisely this. Uh, we have, in this case, three of our triplet BCM neurons, C0, C1, and C2, that all share the same input. Uh, they are connected together with a lateral inhibitory network uh, L, um, and under a mixture model, uh, under a, with mixture model input data, our stable points will not change. Um, however, uh, in 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 with a strong in inhibitory lateral network, each neuron will be selective for a different mixture component with high probability. Um, with an ex excitatory network, each neuron will be selective for the same mixture component, also with high probability. Um, so. In conclusion, uh, we presented a, a generalization of the classical BCM learning rule. Uh, this rule provably learns selectivity for components of a general class of mixture model. Uh, it also fits pairwise and triplet spike timing dependent plasticity data, uh, suggesting a connection between this rule uh, and synaptic modification. Uh, thank you. Do we have any questions? Um, okay, I have one. Um, so you mentioned that you require this multi-view assumption. Um, what happens, in, can you say something about when it's not satisfied? Uh, yeah, so I, yeah, so the, the multi-view assumption is, is not necessarily always available. So what you would imagine with a spike train is, in reality, you don't know precisely when your input stimulus has changed. Uh, so if you sample any, tr any triple, two of them maybe are coming from one class, one of them maybe is coming from the other. Uh, it, you can extend this to a, a, a Markov chain model for the input. Um, with a relatively slow mixing time, so most of the time your triplets will be coming from the same mixture, uh, and this only adds a very small amount of noise to the stable points. They remain mostly the same. Any other questions? Um, if not, let's thank the speaker again.
All right, so it's time for the spotlights. If the spotlight presenters could come lining up in front next to the stage, please. Hello, everybody. Um, let's just start this um, presentation with Patrick Plotsky, who's going to be talking about a Bayesian model for identifying hierarchically organized states in newer population activity. Um, this work was done together with Florian Franzen, Giacomo Vassetto, and Jacob Macke at the BCCN and MPR in Tübingen. And the question we're interested in is how intrinsic network states influence neuropopulation activity and what role they play on um, information processing. We tackle this kind of problem by building generative models which help us to identify those network states and in turn help us to characterize state-dependent neural responses. And we further argue that the population states can be hierarchically organized, and I will use a very simple example to try to show you what I mean by that. So what you see here, oh, I can use the mouse, yes, very good, um, is a, a raster plot of uh, spikes from a population of 200 simulated neurons in a trial of five second length. And on top you see the population rate which is the sum of spikes across all neurons within one time point. And what one could argue now from this plot is that the population alternates between two discrete states, which is an up state in which the spike rates are very high and a down state in which the spike rates are very low. But in fact, what I can tell you since this is uh, simulation is that this population alternates between three discrete states. And, but this is not observable from this raw population data um, I will now uh, reshuffle the neurons in the raster plot to visualize the three st states more easily. So what you can see now is that what I previously called the up state is actually divided into two. One state in which the top half of the population is very active and the bottom half is not, and another state in which is the other way around. And we say that this type of behavior gives rise to hierarchically organized states according to their temporal structure. Um, and you can see it here. Um, the red and the orange state alternate within what, what I previously called the up state, and the hierarchical organization is shown on the left. Okay, and what we're interested in is to develop statistical methods which enable us to identify those uh, states from real data, and in turn enable us to do this kind of reshuffling as we've done here. Okay, so we propose a generative model which uh, is based on a first order hidden Markov model with input dependent uh, transition probabilities which can be hierarchically decomposed and GLM observations. And in our paper we derive Bayesian inference methods for this type of model and evaluate our methods on V1 population data uh, recorded from a macaque. Uh, yeah, if you're interested in our work I would be very happy to talk to you in front of my poster with the ID 49. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Up next, we have Lars Busing talking about cluster factor analysis for multi-neural spiky data. Hi, this is joint work with uh, Timothy Machado, John Cunningham, and Liam Palinski from Columbia University. So uh, in, in neuroscience, um, complex neural circuits are often kind of conceptualized or abstracted away as consisting of a small number of clusters of highly similar neurons. And one model system where this is actually a pretty good uh, approximation to the ground truth in, in which we were uh, particularly interested is, is the mammalian and spinal cord. And amongst other things, it consists of these disjoint pools of motor neurons which project to different muscles, and those are plotted here in these color plots. Uh, and in order to study those um, motor neuron pools, we recorded from them using calcium imaging, um, giving us uh, data for multiple neurons over time. Um, unfortunately, however, the cell labels uh, indicating which um, neuron, uh, uh, which pool the neurons belong to are often not observed. So in order to address this issue, we um, propose a method for unsupervised identification of these, um, of these pools or clusters of, of neurons um, based on a latent variable model. Um, and basically what we do is, uh, on the neuron axis, we, we model the data as a mixture of factor analyzer model to capture the different clusters of neurons. And on the uh, time axis, we capture the dynamics in this data by putting a state space model or a dynamic system model over these unobserved latent factors, capturing hopefully these um, um, complex periodic activity patterns that we found. And if we apply this method to our uh, data, we find basically that it gives 
uh, really high uh, quality clusters, which we could very, uh, validate with external covariates in this uh, specific data set. Um, our model does uh, dimensionality reduction on each cluster, giving us um, kind of concise summary statistics to, to see what's going on. And last but not least, the state space model part of the model um, basically captures putative um, uh, interaction mechanisms between these different pools, um, hopefully giving us more insight in how, how these different clusters or pools of neurons interact to um, generate these uh, activity dynamics. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lars. Um, up next, we're going to have Kirmel Stackenfeld talking about design principles of the hippocampal cognitive map. Good afternoon. I'm Kim Stackenfeld, and my co-authors on this work are Matt Botvinnik and Sam Gershman. It has been known for a while that there exist cells in the brain that fire selectively for particular locations. Place cells are found in the hippocampus and fire when an animal is near a particular location in space. A sample receptive field is shown to the left, where the black lines mark the trajectory of the animal and the red dots mark the locations of the cells firing. A grid field is shown to the right. These fire periodically um, with respect to space and are found in the nearby region of entorhinal cortex. Traditional approaches has, have sought to determine the underlying mechanism that gives rise to place cells and grid cells. While a relatively neglected approach has been the upstream role of these representations. As such, we approach the, pers uh, the subject from the perspective of how these spatial representations are useful in the context of the problems faced by animals. This problem is that of maximizing reward in a world of unknowns, or the reinforcement learning problem. An animal's goal should be to develop a policy that, uh, to maximize va value, or future expected reward. And the animal should therefore represent space so as to easily compute value. An optimally cheap and flexible statistic to maintain is therefore the expected number of times the animal will visit each future location in space, or a successor representation, which we hypothesize is encoded by place cells. We show how this idea can account for a variety of experimental findings, uh, and as is shown by these examples below, and point to testable predictions. Furthermore, the eigen decomposition of this place field map strongly resembles entorhinal grid cells, as shown in the top left figure. Drawing on ideas from spectral graph theory, we show that these eigenvectors are sensitive to the structure of the transition uh, manifold, and in particular to communities in the transition structure. For this reason, grid fields are sensitive to compartments in the environment and can even be used to hierarchically segment the enclosure along natural boundaries. Grid cell representations therefore naturally support hierarchical reinforcement learning by providing natural subgoals. In summary, we demonstrate how optimizing spatial representations for reinforcement learning causes place and grid fields to emerge naturally with relatively few parameters. Thank you and please check out our poster number 73 this evening. Thank you very much, Kimberly. Um, our next speaker is not here, Alison Fletcher. So um, we're going to continue with Ferran Diego Andilla, who's going to be talking about a sparse space time deconvolution for calcium image analysis. Tonight, I would like to present a framework that will help experimentalists to analyze or conduct automatic analysis of calcium imaging. But the main concern, or the main thing, is what is calcium imaging? Calcium imaging is an imaging technique that allows them to record the activity of the, the functional activity of the brain in multiple areas. And then that means that they can monitor a large population of neural activity of hundreds of thousands of in the cells at single cell resolution. The main goal of this work is that given a calcium image data, we want to estimate the locations of cells and the activity when these neurons are firing. And also, we would like to have like the cell, we want to learn the cell appearance and also the typical impulse response that are underlying on this data. In order to achieve this, we propose a unified formulation between matrix factorization and convolutional sparse coding in terms of a single optimization program that exploits the normal structure of the data and then we can produce the spatial representation of this kind of data. The idea is that on the image, we can 
is how we are conducting the, the joint formulation. And, then, and the idea is that we represent every spatial temporal, spatial component and temporal component into a convolution of this fast flowing. The idea is that the main formulation is that we want to approximate the volume data to t plus time into a summation of k latent signals, one dimensional signals that represents that we want to, where one of these, special, every spatial component, we want to infer single and unique cells that, and also at the same time, we want to infer a set of spike frames that helps given some input response that we learn. And we compare with the state of the art algorithms in inferring spike frames or semantic cells, and we perform a comparison with comparable results. And if you are more interested in this process, I will see you, I hope to see you tonight. Thank you very much. Okay, finally, our last presentation is gonna be Christina Sabine, um, talking about spatiotemporal representations of uncertainty in spiking neural networks. Thank you. And this is joint work with Sophie Deneuve at NS Paris. Um, one fundamental challenge for Bayesian uh, approaches trying to understand computation in the brain is to figure out how probability distributions are represented at the level of neural activity. And there are two main classes of models for doing this. The first class, the spatial codes, distribute information about the probability distributions across cells, such that the activity of individual neurons encodes values of the underlying random variables. Alternatively, temporal codes assume a one-to-one -one map between features and the neurons, and the dynamics of the population implement some form of MCMC sampling. Each of these representations have both advantages and disadvantages. The spatial codes can be read out relatively fast, but they're uh, prohibitive in the number of neurons that are required in order to represent multidimensional probability distributions. Uh, in contrast, the temporal codes are really fast, uh, are really good in terms of the number of resources, but this comes at the price of the time required in order to collect the samples. What we propose here is a third class of models that try to combine the best of both worlds by constructing a spatial temporal code. And what this will enable us is to have a linear trade-off between the uh, time required for uh, representing the distribution and the number of neurons. Okay, so, okay, sorry about that. Okay, so the key idea is simple. We, we need to formally separate what is the computation performed in the circuit from the way this computation is represented at the level of neural activity. So for us, the con computation continues to be something based approximate Bayesian inference, but we relax the assumption of a one-to-one -one map between neurons and features. Instead, we assume that we have a linear um, decoder that maps neural responses <laughs> uh, into features, and given this linear decoder, we derive the optimal neural dynamics that encode the target MCMC sampler. Now, why is this interesting? So, uh, such a representation inherits all the computational benefits of a sampling-based representation, to which it adds, adds robustness to neural damage and a substantial increase in speed. In particular, it allows the network to encode simultaneously several independent MCMC chains. Now, from a biological perspective, this kind of model is able to capture a range of experimental data in terms of single neuron and pair of neuron properties and the way they are modulated by an certainty. However, because it is a distributed code, this means that the activity of individual neurons doesn't obviously relate to, uh, to the underlying computation performed by the network. Instead, such a model argues for new uh, population level analysis for probing uh, probabilistic computation at the level of experimental data. And if you want to find out the details, please come to poster 43. So luckily we found our lost speaker, and she's now here. And let's welcome Alison Fletcher, who's gonna be talking about the scalable inference for neural connectivity uh, from calcium imaging. Sorry. Um, okay, so this is joint work with my co-author, Sunny Brungan at NYU Poly. Um, one of the core problems in 
neuroscience is to reconstruct the synaptic connections between networks of neurons. Um, we address this connectivity problem with calcium imaging. Um, and calcium imaging is a relatively new technology that allows observations of populations of neurons um, via optical measurements instead of electrical measurements. So basically, neurons are um, modified so that they fluoresce when they spike. And this modification is done by either optically, by either optogenetically transfecting them with a calcium indicator or loading them with calcium sensitive dyes. So then one can actually just, you know, actually take the population of neurons, look at that area of neurons, um, stimulate it with light, and then actually measure the, sp the, sp the, the flashes of images. So you measure the resultant emitting images, light, to actually get the spiking potentials for that class of neurons. And this is a very powerful technology because you can monitor hundreds to a thousand neurons in parallel. Um, you can do it in vivo and you can do it in vitro. Um, you can actually look at cortical neurons at different depths with a two photon mic microscope so you can penetrate different depths and monitor that there. So then one could take these actual statistical connections between these observations of the fluorescences and figure out and infer the connectivity pattern. So there are tremendous challenges in inferring connectivity from calcium imaging. So first of all, it's a very, very indirect system. You're actually getting these fluorescent traces, which are more like blurred movies. They're not action potentials. So, and you know, additionally, spiking is actually not even that associated with um, synaptic connections. So there's also a lot of nonlinear dynamics. The neuron itself is a nonlinear dynamical system. The calcium imaging itself and fluorescence processes are non involve nonlinear dynamical systems. We have, of course, very large neuronal data sets. We have a number of hidden inputs. We have exogenous inputs. We have external stimuli we can't model. Um, probably the most significant challenge for this problem, though, is that there's a heavy temporal blurring. So if you look at the um, graph to the left there, these early researchers, so this is 2003 is early for calcium imaging, um, early researchers glutamate-induced spiking, and there are a number of spikes over 100 milliseconds. But if you look at the calcium fluorescence above there, and you look at the decay rate of that, it's over a few seconds. So we have this heavy temporal deblurring um, you know, that, you, that you have to be doing. And that would be okay if you were looking for an average rate of spiking. But we're actually trying to do connectivity, so we need a precise timing for interneuronal causality. Um, oh, my arm's done. Sorry, um, it also has a very low frame rate, so the frames are at an order of magnitude um, slower than, than the interneuronal dynamics, so we need a super resolution. So I took three sentences. So our main contribution is a scalable, systematic algorithm to infer connectivity. It combines graphical models with the expectation um, framework, and we did it on cortical neurons and come to poster 70 and hear more about it. Thank you very much, and please let's thank all of our speakers again.